Perfect timing. Good morning. Really good to see you all here. A really warm welcome um, to those joining us in the building and a really warm welcome to the the many folks uh, watching on Facebook Live. Whether you're here in the flesh um, or you're here through the technology, you're so welcome. And I hope you feel um, a part of everything that we do today together. Special welcome if you're here in the building or online um, for the first time. Uh, My name's Peter. Uh, If we've not met, um, I'm the minister here at the church. Um, Today we are going to continue, in fact conclude, um, our studies in the book of Romans. Um, If it's your first time here, don't worry, no prior knowledge is assumed. Um, But that's what we'll be looking at together as we read and study the Bible. Um, All of the the other information and various announcements for the week ahead you can get on our service sheet, which normally we'd give out on the door, but we can't do that just now, so you can download that in the usual place, burkeadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service, as well as some activities uh, for kids and youth. The only other thing to say, as I'm now in the habit of saying every week, is that we'd love to see you here next week in the building. Um, If you're here, please come back. If you're online, uh, we'd love you to come and join us if you feel able. And uh, you do just need to book a seat for each week, um, at the moment at least, and you can do that again at burkeadfreechurch.org or by giving me a call, and that's my number on the screen. Uh, Of course, those of us in the building are sadly not able to sing, um, though I'm reliably reliably informed we can hum. So you can hum to your heart's content. Um, Those at home, you can sing to your heart's content. And we're going to begin with a song. Um, You'll see on the screen some members of our congregation, uh, some of whom are here today, leading us uh, in some words from Psalm 95. It's a psalm of joy and of praise to God uh, for all that he is and all that he's done. So we'll remain seated. You can stand at home if you want. But here's that song for us just now. psalm speaks of worshipping God, of coming to him in prayer, and later on in the psalm it speaks of uh, hearing God speak to us. And those are all the things we're going to do as we gather today. We want to teach uh, God's word, the Bible, to all ages. And so we always have a little slot and a little thought for the children. It's great to have some children with us in the building today and more at home. We've been learning from something called the New City Catechism, which as you'll see, is a series of questions and answers that help us to learn and memorize things that are true about God. And if you've not been here, we've been having some special visitors to my house every week who've been teaching us uh, questions and answers from the catechism uh, through the medium of some quite interesting songs. And today is no exception, so we'll hand over to them. Good morning, boys and girls. Good to see you again. Last week, we were learning about how God made people, boys and girls, men and women. But this week, our question is, what else did God make? Well, I've come into this field here today to see some of the lovely things, the wonderful things that God has made. So that's today's question. What else did God make? And we've got some friends again with a song 
to help you learn the answer. So, take it away. God created all things, created all things by his powerful word. God created all things, created all things by his powerful word. Well, uh, another quite special experience, I think you'll agree. And uh, I've been singing that all week, so hopefully you will too, boys and girls. And um, someone asked the other week if we're going to put a compilation together of these songs, which we will at some point, um, so the kids can have that uh, to use. One of the other great things we've been doing these last few weeks is to hear from some of our mission partners. We have four uh, mission partners that we're particularly connected with, um, spreading and sharing the good news of Jesus uh, all around the world in different places. And uh, it's so good today to have one of our mission partners here, not just on the screen, but in the flesh. Um, So Roddy, why don't you come and join us? I'm going to move to this microphone. My face isn't too bad, so I can take the mask off. They keep telling me I have a face for radio, Roddy. So, (laughs) Roddy, it's great to have you with us. Um, Some will know you very well. um, But just for the benefit of those who might not, tell us a bit about yourself and also a bit about what SASRA is, which is the organization that you work for. Well, my name is Roddy McLeod. I I come from the Isle of Lewis. I hope you're able to understand my dulcet tones and my accent. Uh, I've been working for SASRA for 14 years now, and I spent nine of these years in Purbright Training Centre, which is a a huge recruit stable down in Surrey. And uh, for the past five years, I've been up here uh, in Fort George in Kinloss Barracks, working with the soldiers there. SASRA, as an organisation, has existed since 1838, and for all these years, ex-soldiers like myself and ex-airmen have been spending their time in army bases, bringing, I love this phrase here, knowing Jesus, making Jesus known. We know God, and we want everyone else to know God, and our calling is specifically to soldiers and airmen. Uh, So that's, that's what Sasra does and has done for all these years. I know that lockdown, like for everyone else, has has meant big changes for you. Give us a flavour just before lockdown, in normal life, what that looked like day to day. Day to day, I put on this uniform. I I go out. I live. We live on the on the army estate, on the army patch, as it were. So we live amongst the soldiers, and we also. I go to the barracks. I spend my days. This this work areas, this recreation areas, and 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 all the areas are open to me. I'm able to go as as much as I please, anywhere I please, speak to anyone I please, and bring the message of God to the soldiers. I want to do that by befriending them, by uh, getting to know them, uh, by, by just interacting with them, being around with them, helping them if I can. If there's somebody who needs a lift somewhere, it's just very simple things like that. Sometimes you come across soldiers who are in trouble, and are struggling and if they present themselves to me I'm able to help them out with that and bring them to someone who can help that so in the in Kinloss and Fort George I I mostly spend my days walking around talking to anyone that's interested to talk to me prior to that in Purbright we'd have Sunday service with two to four hundred recruits 
would have groups coming on a Friday of 50 to 60 injured soldiers that I would spend time with and lots and lots of opportunities. But up here in the Highlands, in, in, uh, in the field army, they call it, not, not amongst recruits, there's very little organized uh, Christian activities. So that's why it's different to Purbright. In Purbright, they have to go to church. They, they have no choice. So you have large amounts of people coming. So up here, it's kind of wandering around, talking to anyone that will be willing to talk to me and sharing something of Jesus with them. Tell us, Roddy, about lockdown then. That's obviously meant big changes for everyone. How has that affected your ministry and also SASRA more, more widely? Well, lockdown, lockdown as a family, uh, we were, I was furloughed for five months, so I was literally at home for five months. And we would be having the boys for homeschooling, and there was one day with Samuel, uh, I was homeschooling, and I was starting to get a little bit impatient with him about halfway through. And he says, okay, we'll stop and we'll pray. So we stopped and we prayed. And then we carried on with the lesson. And the next day, the next morning, I was saying to Samuel, I'm doing the lesson again today. And he said, Daddy, can we pray at the beginning this time? <laughs> so, uh, so lockdown was a bit like that. It was quite intense, really, being, being bottled up together so long. But I think it, it matured us in many ways in our relationship with my wife and my children. Uh, Sasha itself, many of us were furloughed. Uh, there was only a, hand, a couple, two or three still working, and even the work they were doing was very, very restricted. Uh, we, as an organization, depend wholly on the givings of the Christian public. That's where all our finance comes from. We don't get paid by the MOD, uh, although they do give us some perks, but they don't generally give us a wage, as it were. So all our finance comes from the, the, the Christian public. However, because of the furlough scheme and, and other things, we've, we're still afloat, we still exist. Uh, we hope to get through this year. Uh, next year will be a strange year. Uh, who knows? Tell us then about ministry post-lockdown. I know things are changing, things are happening digitally. Mm. Give us a flavor of how that might look in the future. Yeah, well, we're doing a lot of stuff online now. and I've just been back to work about three weeks now, full-time. And uh, we're, as you see, with cameras and, and digital stuff now, everyone is moving that way. So I, I could just tell a little story of uh, this week on Friday. I was preparing a couple of videos for uh, Remembrance Sunday. They're all going to be compiled together into one big video for Remembrance Sunday to be sent out to churches. And uh, at Kinloss at the moment, we have Typhoon Jets visiting us from Lossiemouth. And I wanted to have some of them in the background because it looks nice and warry and uh, exciting. So I went to the, the RAF guys that are there. And of course, security is a very big issue with all of the military, but particularly things like typhoon jets. So I was asking, can I, can I video with them in the background? And they were okay with that, but they wanted someone to come with me. So they sent this very, very, very pleasant young a female air tech of some sort, a very pleasant young lady, and she came along with me and, and she had a radio for any instructions she might get. And she was actually able to help me out with my phone and, and the stand and starting and stopping the video. So we managed to produce these videos. Uh, but what really pleased me was that this young girl heard my little sermons as I was presenting them to the video. We had an amazing chat afterwards and I was able to give her, uh, I have my testimony in a little tracked and I also have another little booklet that's kind of a testimony as well that I give out to the soldiers and I was able to pass that on to her and off she went hmm. back to her work so videoing online lots of that stuff coming forward now mm -hmm. uh, as we go forward with uh, with the lockdown it's great really to have uh, Esther and Samuel and Timothy with us today this is maybe the most important question of all you're one of our mission partners how can we best support you and, and pray for you? Prayer is really, really important. I've noticed over the years, there's been times when Sasa have had times of special prayer uh, with various events, like uh, uh, the 100th anniversary of the battle of the end of World War I, sorry, and things like that. There was kind of a, a surge of prayer, if I can put it that way. And I noticed at these times that the work seems to be so much easier. Things just happen. You know, there's one thing I don't do. 
And that is force the issue. When you're speaking to soldiers and airmen, if you force the issue, if you preach at them, it doesn't work. But when it happens just quite naturally, the conversation comes around to God. Like that young girl on Friday, it just quite naturally happened where we were able to have a spiritual conversation. That's really what I'm looking for. So pray for these conversations. Pray for not just the conversations, but that they will do something with the information they gather. Because what I come across often is an absolutely staggering indifference to the gospel. Total indifference. And I would love to see that change. I would love to see soldiers coming to me. Can I spend time with you? Can we look at the Bible? Can we learn more? Can we do more? Is there anything I can do to find God? These kind of questions. So pray for these opportunities. Pray for my family. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be married to uh, Esther, who is uh, from Singapore. Pray for Esther. She's a long way from home. Her, all her family are in Singapore. Uh, we were hoping to go on a trip this year, but we had to can it because of the, the lockdown. Pray for the boys. Pray for us as a family. The Lord has been incredibly good to us. You wouldn't believe the things that have happened in our lives in the goodness of God. So pray for that. I spent, if anyone here is looking for a wife, I spent 11 years praying for a wife. And there was one thing I was determined. I was determined to have God's answer. And there was the odd occasion where you could short circuit God's plan, if you like. Uh, but he kept me from that. So 11 years I don't want to put anyone off if they're praying for a wife. It might not take 11 years. But uh, it's worth waiting. God's plan is the best plan. And I'm glad I waited. And I'm glad it's Esther. You know, when I think of my wife and family, he didn't just give me a wife and family. He gave me this wife and family. And they're fantastic. And I love them very much. Really, thanks. This is not in the script, but can I just let me, let me pray just now? Yes, please, yeah. For Sasha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with Roddy and the family and to hear from him. <clears throat> Father, we pray for his work and the work of Sazra more broadly. Um, Lord, we pray that you would um, give great opportunities and natural opportunities yeah. uh, to speak about Jesus, um, not just to know him ourselves, but to make him known. Yeah. Lord, we pray, please will you uh, bring across Roddy's path <clears throat> people who will be and interested and open to know more of the things of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Esther and for the boys. We pray for your blessing on them as a family. Um, Lord, we pray that you would lead them and use them um, for your glory, for the progress of the gospel. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to leave it with Roddy now, who's going to read for us and then lead us in prayer as well. So, Roddy, thank you. Okay, we're reading from Romans chapter 8. And verses 1, uh, sorry, verses 31 to verse 39. Romans 8, uh, verse 31 to 39. More than conquerors. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God hath chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine our nakedness, our danger, our sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, that neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Amen. And may the Lord bless these wonderful words uh, to our hearts. We love our scriptures, don't we? Love the scriptures. And God speaks to the scriptures, through the scriptures. And let us now come to him in prayer. He loves to hear our prayers. He loves our prayers. He loves to hear us coming to him. And even if our coming to him is a groan, in fact, maybe a groan is a more effectual prayer than a, a spoken prayer at times. Let's pray. O gracious God, O Lord God, King of kings and Lord of lords, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one wonderful and perfect God, we give thanks that we can read things like we've read just now, uh, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, and that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of Christ. We give thanks that our salvation, once we have it, is secure forever and ever and ever. And we thank you uh, that this world is not the end. This world is such a dark and difficult place and so troubled, so full of violence and hate. And even that hate was vented on Christ himself uh, in his time in this world. But yet, it was your plan to bruise him uh, to, so that we, helpless sinners, can find life through his blood and his sacrifice. We pray that you would help us all as we go about the daily activities of our business in whatever context we are in. We pray that you would help us to reach out to those around us, to make Jesus known because we know him. Help us to make him known to those that don't. And we know that your words do not return void, that when we speak, uh, that those that hear will be changed uh, in one way or another. We thank you for the opportunities we have as believers uh, to live in a free society, uh, yet re so far without uh, much persecution in this part of the world at least. We pray for those that are persecuted. Many today could be facing death today simply because they believe in Jesus. We thank you that uh, when we believe that you give courage for these things and you give grace for such things. And we pray, uh, should opposition come against us, that we would have the courage and grace too to do what's right and to be faithful to you. We pray for those that are uh, struggling with, with infirmity, with old age, who are perhaps particularly nervous about the virus uh, and are vulnerable to the virus, we pray that you would comfort them in their own hearts and give them peace and that you would bless all of us here today. We're all different. We all have different needs and we pray that you would just bless us according to our needs. We might be struggling. We might be having a hard time in some way. We might be joyous and rejoicing and glad, but we're all different and you're a God that knows everything. You know every thought that passes through our minds. You know every hair on our head. You know our life situation perfectly. And you tell us in the word of God, the beautiful, wonderful scriptures of God, that all things work together for good to those that love him. We thank you that whatever way we look at our spiritual life, whatever way we look at our faith, it's covered by you. There is no uh, loophole somewhere that's going to cause us a problem because you uh, are sovereign in every area of life. And we thank you for that. We thank you for Burkhead Free Church. Thank you for Peter particularly and his family and all the people that uh, put, play their part here, as it were, to bring these services uh, to the public, we thank you uh, that, there's, that there are so many people so willing to do so much for the kingdom of God, and we pray that you would bless them. Pray for every person here today, that pray, pray that every person is a saved person, every person watching online is a saved person, and if they're not, help them to realize that they're not, and to realize that they can be a saved person. All we have to do is repent and believe and your spirit will help with that how much more will you give the holy spirit to those that ask for it we thank you for the spirit 
that lives in our hearts, that enables us every day to live for you, enables us to believe, enables us to repent, enables us to do everything. Praise God for this wonderful life, this life in the Spirit and the Word. Thank you for it. And we pray that you would now bless uh, Peter as he takes the rest of the sermon, open our hearts to hear it, and bless us richly, and forgive all our many sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic to have you here, Roddy and family. Um, if you've uh, closed it, why don't you open up again, um, if you have a Bible, at Romans chapter 8 from verse 31. If you're watching online, or indeed if you're here and you haven't got a Bible in your hands, don't worry. Um, everything you need will be on the screen, so you can follow along there as well. Uh, if you were here last week, I, I began last week's talk by telling you about the first time my wife Morag was in labor, uh, giving birth to our eldest daughter, Ruth. And uh, since Morag likes me talking about these things publicly so much, um, and since Ruth is not at all embarrassed by these stories, I thought I would, re would return to the subject today. Uh, you might remember I said last week that, that the winter that Ruth was born uh, was the worst winter in decades in Sheffield, where we lived at the time. Snow had been on the ground for weeks. That is a genuine picture from that summer uh, in Sheffield. And uh, when, uh, when we, the, the, the labor began, uh, my neighbor and I had to dig the car out of the snow. When we eventually made it through the snow to the labor ward, we discovered, as I said last week, there were six other women giving birth, but only one midwife had made it through the snow to be there. Safe to say it was a nightmare shift for her. Much of that night, we were just on our own. The labor was not particularly straightforward, and so after about 30 hours, it became clear that some kind of assistance was needed. More staff had made it in by that point. Um, I'm really putting you off labor, by the way, aren't I? And, and a doctor was to be called. And having spent most of the night on our own um, and feeling very anxious, I can tell you I will never forget the feeling of relief there was when the consultant, the senior consultant, walked in the door. She didn't look quite like that. That might have not been so comforting. But I felt such a relief when she arrived. We weren't through the drama, but after many hours all at sea with no one to help, there was at last the feeling that we were in safe hands and that the competent work and the diligent care of this consultant was just what we need it. Well, today we reach the end of our studies in Romans. The book divides roughly into two, and we've reached the natural break. And as we finish the end of this first section, Paul, the author, wants you to know that if you're a Christian, you can feel, you should feel, that same kind of relief and assurance because you are in the safest hands possible. If I could put it this way, that the competent work of Jesus and the loving care of Jesus are enough for you. If you belong to Jesus, there is no condemnation because the work of Christ will stand for you. And there will be no separation from the love of Christ which will enfold you. Those are our two simple headings today. So here's the first. No condemnation. The work of Christ is will stand. Paul really starts to draw his thoughts together here at the end of eight long chapters of explaining the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he does that by saying this, verse 31, what then shall we say in response to these things? That that is everything he said so far. How can we sum it up? What does it all mean for us as a Christian? Well, read on. Paul summarizes if God is for us, who can be against us? Now that is the first of three possible accusations or threats which Paul identifies, which, which might come against a Christian like you or me. Um, just notice them to begin with. Verse 31, who can be against us? Verse 33, who will bring any charge? And verse 34, who then is the one that condemns? 
So in our mind's eye, Paul has us back in the courtroom again. It's been a favorite kind of location of his as he's explained the Christian message to us. And remember, he began by showing us the seriousness of our sin, our guilt, that each one of us has. Deep down, each one of us knows the reality of God, but we have suppressed the truth of God and ceased to worship God. And we've become, therefore, darkened in our understanding and foolish in our living. That is our sin. Paul said it's serious and it cuts us off from the God we were made to know. And remember, this is chapter 3, verse 19, if nothing can be done about that, there will come a day of reckoning in the courtroom of God, as it were, where we will stand silent, guilty, and defenseless, with nothing we can do, not a word we can say, or a thing we can do to avoid God's guilty verdict and the punishment that rightly follows. And yet, Paul went on to explain to us the amazing good news of the gospel. That God was not content to leave his people in that state. And so he sent his own son, the Lord Jesus, who died, quote, as an atoning sacrifice. Which just means when Jesus died on the cross, it's as if he stepped into the courtroom dock in our place, on our behalf, and willingly took the punishment we deserved. That, Paul says, is the righteousness from God that has been revealed. What Jesus has done, that is God's right way for us to be put right with him. And it comes to you, or it can come to you, very simply, by faith. We choose to accept and to trust in what Jesus has done on our behalf. Now, of course, Paul has said that's not the end of the story. The Jesus who saves us from sin doesn't want to leave us in our sin. He, he enters our lives by his Holy Spirit, as Roddy was just praying. And his Spirit gradually works in us to change us, to, to turn us more and more away from sin, and more and more to transform us into his likeness. And so now as he's rounding off, Paul returns to this kind of courtroom theme to assure us or to reassure us that because of all Jesus has done, in the courtroom of God, no accusation can ever be made to stick on us if we belong to Jesus. In the courtroom of God, no one can stand against us. No one can issue a charge or bring a condemnation upon us. Every challenge, if it were to come, would just be turned away. Each challenger would be silenced by the cross of Christ. So let's look at them, these hypothetical challenges. First, who can be against us? Look at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how, he'll, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Paul's logic is pretty simple. It's just this. If God was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to save you, that is giving his own son, the Lord Jesus, if God has overcome your sin, which was the greatest of all barriers to you ever being in God's kingdom, if he didn't even stop at sacrificing the life of his own son, do you really think he will let anything else get in the way of you belonging forever in his kingdom? Do you really think that on the day of judgment anyone could stand against you? Would God let that happen when he has gone to such great and costly lengths to rescue you? Of course not. Now the language there that Paul uses of, of not sparing his son has, has echoes, if you know it, um, of that intriguing and disturbing Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, Abraham was tested by God by being asked to sacrifice his own son. But of course at the last moment God steps in and stops him. And yet at the cross of Jesus, there was no last-minute reprieve for God's Son. He went all the way to death for you. So you can be certain you will go all the way to God's kingdom for all eternity if you trust in him. 
Verse 33, next hypothetical challenge, who will bring any charge? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who will bring a charge that, that can stick on you? No one. God has justified you. You are in Christ. Do you remember chapter 3, verse 25? God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. And we learned a word that week. The word was propitiation. Uh, that is to say that Jesus has paid a penalty, borne the punishment that we deserved. So justice has been served, and the right justified anger of God at sin has been turned away. It's God who's done that. It's God who's justified you if you're a Christian. Do you really think that anyone will be able to make a charge stick when God is the one who's justified you? Of course not. Challenge three. Who will condemn us? Verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Paul says, see, it's not just that Christ died, but that he was raised. In other words, there's no ambiguity in terms of his victory over sin and death. He was raised, he is now at the right hand of God, which is the position of ultimate power and authority. And that person, the Lord Jesus, who is in that power, that position of ultimate power and authority, now speaks to God on your behalf if you're a Christian. He will condemn you if he is in your corner. No one. If you belong to Jesus, there is no condemnation for you. That's true. God may discipline you on your journey through life. To, to change us, to help us. Um, I'm reminded that every good shepherd has a rod and a hook uh, to bring back the wayward sheep and give them a whack and keep them in line. God may discipline us, but he will never, ever condemn us if we are in Christ. Now, if you've been a Christian any length of time, I guess you're used to that truth. But that is no small thing. Remember the journey we've come on through the book of Romans. We began by seeing the real seriousness of our sin. It is an enormous thing that Jesus has done for us. No condemnation. But secondly, if that weren't enough, no separation. No separation. The love of Christ will enfold you. Two things to notice here. Suffering can't separate us, and victory can't be snatched from us. So first, letter D, if you're following on the screen or the sheet. Suffering can't separate us. Look at verse 35 now. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now we'll get into the sheep thing in a moment. Here Paul is basically listing a bunch of sufferings that we may well face in life. And it's a grim list, isn't it? These are things that you and I may well face. And when we do, when trouble or hardship comes you and I will be tempted to think, God's abandoned me. Or, why is God allowing this? Or, I, I thought that God was my father and, and I was his child. Why is this happening? You will be tempted to think, when suffering comes, that that suffering has separated you from Christ, certainly from his love. But Paul says, do not believe a word of it. These experiences are common to life and trying and painful as they are, they have no ultimate power to rob you of the love of Jesus or to separate you from the eternal future that Jesus brings you if only you'll trust him. Roddy was 
mentioning Christian persecution as he prayed. And I often think it's interesting when you hear of Christians, often in far-off lands, who really do face real and serious persecution for following Jesus, very often are they not the people who speak of having a particular sense of the closeness, the nearness of Jesus and of his loving presence. Suffering cannot snatch that from you. That's what Paul is getting at here. Now, the stuff about being like sheep to be slaughtered, that's a quote from Psalm 44. And in that psalm, God's people are suffering persecution, opposition, in exile, away from the promised land. And the promised land was the very place where they were confident they did have God's presence. And so away from that, in exile, they might have thought that that God's presence was gone from them, that they were cut off from his love forever. But no, Paul uses that very experience as an example to say, nothing and nobody can separate you from the love of Christ. Indeed, in suffering, we may even have a sense of being closer to Christ because Jesus himself is one who suffered and who suffered for us. So suffering cannot separate us and, letter E, victory can't be snatched from us. Look at verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, I love Paul, he, he occasionally just makes up new words when he thinks there isn't a word that's, that's quite right to describe the amazing things that Christ has done. He, he makes up a word here, um, the NIV has translated it very nicely, more than conquerors. More literally, the word is super conquerors. Because Christ loves us and has died in our place for our sin and been raised to life, we are bound to come out on the conquering, the the, the winning, the victorious side. If you're a Christian, Paul is not saying you're a super conqueror because you are anything special. You are not. We are super conquerors because we're, we're tied up with Jesus and he's won the victory. And just like in a war, it's good to have Roddy here today, just like in war, a conqueror gets the spoils of battle, well, Christ has won the battle against sin and death. And so as we are conquerors with him, we get to inherit the treasures. And the treasures in this case are forgiveness and new life, eternal life in his kingdom. And again, whatever we may come up, come against in the course of life cannot and will not snatch that victory away. There are plenty of things in life that will trouble us, even traumatize us, and even terrify us. But ultimately there is nothing and no one who can snatch the victory from us that Christ has won for us when he conquered sin and death, when he died and when he rose. And as he ends, to make that point again with more force, Paul lists a bunch of of extreme pairs of things. You see it there? Life and death, angels and demons, present, future, height, depth. Often when you read the Bible, you'll, you'll hear the phrase, the heavens and the earth. It's just kind of a a turn of phrase, almost a catchphrase that that means everything. Heaven and earth, high stuff and low stuff, and everything in between. Everything. And Paul's doing that that same sort of thing here. The point is not to get caught up in the details about the angels or the demons or whatever. The, The point is just that simply no one and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and the victory he's won for us. Not this, not that. Not life, not death, not angels, nor demons, nor height, nor depth, nor present, nor the future, nor anything else between nothing and nobody ever can snatch away the victory. And so as we end, um, I say as we end, I I know this may be your first week in Romans, but as we end this little series of studies, I, I wonder how you feel. 
I wonder how you feel as we've studied these eight chapters over 13 weeks. If you were here at the beginning, you probably won't remember, but I said that I hoped Romans would do two things for us. For Christians, I hoped it would help us to see and understand the depths of the gospel and that it would fire us up, not just to know that gospel ourselves, but to make it known. And remember, one of the reasons that Paul was writing to the church in Rome was to fire them up to support him on his next mission trip uh, to Spain, which may even have included the idea of some people from Rome going with him to do that. So if you're a Christian, do you love Jesus more at the end of this study? Do you understand and, and appreciate the gospel more? And are you more fired up to make it known to more people. Secondly, I spoke a word at the, at the very beginning to those who were joining us. Um, it was all online at that stage, but in person or, or online, who don't yet know Jesus as their own Savior and Lord. And I said that I hoped as we went through these chapters and as Paul explained the gospel at length and in, and in detail, that, that you would come to know it for yourself. To know that your sin really does separate you from God. That it is a serious business. That if nothing can be done, then we are facing death and judgment. But that the gospel is so good and so needed. That Christ has gone to die on the cross for you in your place. To bear your sin. Not just somebody else's, but yours. And that if you will turn to him and trust in him, receive him as your saviour, then this glorious future can be your glorious future. Your real sin can really be forgiven. And you yourself can be adopted as a child in the family of God, knowing God as your father, fellow Christians as your brothers and sisters. And you too can walk a new life, walking in the spirit, as Paul puts it, walking with the help of God's Spirit now to live a new life and looking forward to a glorious and guaranteed future of eternal life with Jesus. Folks, that's Romans chapter 1 to 8. May God bless it to us and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the glorious and wonderful things that you have done for us through Jesus. Lord, we're humbled as we sit here today. We we know that we don't belong to you because of anything we are or anything that we have done. Father, we acknowledge again that, that we deserve nothing from you but your condemnation. In one sense, Lord, if justice was served, that that's what we'd get. But Lord, how we thank you that Jesus has stepped into the dock on our behalf to bear our penalty on the cross and that he has been raised from death. Father, we pray that this good news of the gospel would bring us joy, would fire us and inspire us to make it known. And Lord, we pray that today, whether in the building here or or listening online, there would be those, Lord, in whom you're at work, who would perhaps even today turn and trust in Jesus and find forgiveness and new life in him. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing or hum um, as we close. Here's a song that, that uses a different metaphor. It's not so much the law court as the temple. And it pictures Jesus, as the scriptures do, as a priest um, who makes a sacrifice of himself on our behalf. So we'll sing before the throne of God above.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Let's pray as we close. And we pray that the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest upon us and remain with us today and forevermore. Amen. Folks, so good to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining uh, online as well. We'll let the live stream just play uh, for a bit longer as the music plays us out. Uh, if you're here in the building, uh, we do need to be careful not to hang around and chat in here. I know that that is our natural inclination and what we want to do and in many ways should do um, as God's people. Uh, but we'll head out of the other door and uh, when you're outside, you can take your mask off as well. So that's a bonus. Good to see you. We'll see you again soon.